Thank you very much. In, uh, in these chapters, we are back in 1 Corinthians. I know not everyone will have been here with us all the way through the series, but um, for those who have been, um, I hope that feels like a kind of gloomy um, experience. We're back with the messed up church of Corinth. See, on a, a Sunday in Corinth, we could um, stand at the front like this and look out down the rows and see huge areas of people there and there and over there who don't think they really belong, who would be sitting there in the meeting thinking, oh, I'm not like the others. I'm, uh, I'm not as good as the others. I, I'm not really part of Jesus' body. And uh, next to them, kind of there, and big group of you over there and some more here, uh, would be other people who agree with them um, because they are the special ones. Um, you're right, you lot don't belong. Um, the church only needs people like me, um, would be how they'd be thinking. Isn't that a, isn't that a terrible thing, um, to have a church that was split like that? And the split, um, the split isn't because of race, um, though that does get a mention in verse 13. It, it wasn't because of social class, though we know they care too much about that from chapter 1. This is a type of prejudice and discrimination that you have to be a Christian to be able to do. Only Christians can do this one. Um, some of you I know know these chapters well, but please don't miss the shock that these chapters even exist at all. What is the thing that is smashing up the church in Corinth? It's a fight about who has the best spiritual gift. Who has the Holy Spirit given the best treat to? Uh, God gave me this one, uh, so I'm better than you. I don't need you. Did you hear that note as we were reading? And it, it is to that situation. Paul, um, he didn't write these chapters to answer every modern question about spiritual gifts. Sorry about that, if that's why you came. Uh, he wrote this to crack heads together and to get rid of dangerous church-splitting ignorance. Verse 1, I don't want you to be uninformed. It is a telling off. He's writing to tell them off these chapters and tell them what is wrong in what they're doing and what is dangerous. It's a rebuke section. And before we start on it, I just want to check that that's okay with um, 21st century Londoners, postmodern people. I want to check we're ready for that. Is it, um, is it ever okay to take someone's spiritual experience and say, wrong? Uh, or is it ever okay to ask them to stop that thing you're doing spiritually, do you mind just, just stopping that? Are we ready for someone to say that? See, that then the moment someone criticizes a spiritual experience, people assume they are arrogant and controlling and also limited in their own spiritual experiences. Um, you must never have seen God act if you're criticizing me for doing that. But Paul isn't arrogant or controlling. If you were here since the beginning, then... This whole letter with a church like this is full of love and patience, even for them. And he has really had some spiritual experiences, um, like actually physically meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, for instance. And he's done miracles, um, you know, just little ones, like raising people from the dead. But still he looks at some of their most loved spiritual experiences and can say wrong and stop to some of them. And he's able to do that without denying they're real Christians um, or denying that they're really spiritual. Um, he knows these people are brothers. They're keen. They, they want what they should want, but they are ignorant, misled, sinful, distracted about spiritual gifts. And uh, here is their basic problem in the heading on the sheet. Um, you, uh, you ask them about spiritual gifts, and you ask them, whose are they? And the Corinthian says, my gift is mine, my own. When Paul needs them to understand, your gift belongs to other people. It's for other people. Um, it's theirs, not yours. Theirs, not mine. See, like um, most other things in Corinth, it had all gone a little bit toddler. Um, you may not have my experience with two-year-olds at the moment, but um, this is basically where they are. Their, their, their use of gifts is possessive. Everything is it's mine. Um, it's selfish. 
and it's competitive. It's about making me look glorious and better than you. Um, So Paul cannot leave them uninformed. And uh, the first thing he wants to do, point one, let's get this right. Who has the Spirit? Verses 1 to 3. And verses 1 to 3, he says that in spiritual things, there is just a very, very basic contrast. Um, You were pagans, verse 2, and now you are Christians, verse 3. You you used not to have the Spirit, and now you do. Um, And that is the basic, basic spiritual distinction. Pagan or Christian? Who has the Spirit? Every single Christian. At the end of verse 3, no one can say... Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Um, That doesn't mean that, um, I don't know, every secret agent in a communist country who's ever infiltrated a church and uh, said those three words is kind of definitely a Christian and has the Spirit. He means if you believe in Jesus, if you believe it, if Jesus is your Lord, if you've turned your back on your old idols, verse 2, then you are a Christian, and every single Christian has the Spirit. I don't know if you can remember as far back as chapter 2, it was the same contrast. You have natural people who do not have the Spirit of God and who cannot accept the gospel. And then you have spiritual people who have received the, the, the the Spirit of God and they can accept the gospel. That's the only distinction that counts. And um, just, just while we're here, I think there is a negative implication to that. Uh, for all the vast numbers of other religions in Paul's day and in our day, um, he sees their sophistication, he sees their history, their ceremonial glories, and he says, verse 2, your idols are mute and you don't have the Spirit. I, I don't mean to hurt people's feelings, but the Bible disagrees with our culture's assumption that you can find spiritual people in all manner of places. Paul says to be spiritual, there is a connection you need to Jesus Christ. Jesus as Lord is the one who sends the Spirit. And if you don't have that connection, then you do not have the Spirit. And that's the negative implication. But the the big point here is positive. Um, He means to to rule in every single Christian in Corinth, uh, including the people there, 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 and there, who don't think that they're good enough spiritually. You all have the Spirit. Um, It keeps coming up in the chapter. I've put the references on the sheet. So um, verse 6, these gifts and services and activities, they are empowered in how many people? In everyone. Verse 7, they are given, who to? To each. Verse 11, the Spirit is apportioned uh, to how many people? To each one individually. Verse 13, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body and all were made to drink of one spirit. So um, how do you find out who has the spirit? You find out whether they are a Christian or not. Um, If you're a Christian, you have the spirit. Whatever gift you have, whatever experiences you have or haven't had, Whatever the spiritual snobs in Corinth think of you, you have the Spirit. Um, And compare the snob to to his opinion, and he matters more. The Holy Spirit, he thinks you belong. He dwells in you. He's in you. You have received him. He has been poured out on you. Um, You really have the Spirit. Now, can you see how important that is in Corinth? Can you see why he starts there and basically spends all of chapter 12 um, thundering home that, prob- that, that point. Can you see what a difference that would make to their prejudice problem? So if you want to fix racism, you need to make people see that we are all the same on the inside. Uh, if you want to fix spiritual segregation, you need to convince people that all Christians are the same on the inside. Now, in the nature of this series, we'll be in uh, these three chapters for four weeks. Um, We will need to stop every now and then and disagree with um, something that a lot of my friends think uh, on all sorts of various issues about the Spirit. We'll do that in all sorts of directions. Um, And we need to stop here 
and notice that not all Christians today agree with verses 1 to 3. Um, Or to be fairer to them, I should say they don't agree with them enough, uh, or not the way that Paul does. See, for over 100 years, there has been a movement uh, of teaching uh, in Christianity that all Christians may have the Spirit dwelling in them, but they haven't been baptized in the Spirit. And they haven't received the Spirit in all his fullness. In particular, they don't have the Spirit in the way that produces the gifts in this chapter. Um, That movement is called Pentecostalism, um, but the idea has spread way, way beyond that movement um, and is is into kind of all the kind of normal charismatic churches and camps that I grew up with um, in various ways to various degrees. And I guess um, in a big group like this, um, probably most of us, certainly a large number here, will have grown up um, with that thinking the way that I did. Um, So I want to address it now for quite a long time, I'm afraid. For those of you who are kind of counting how many minutes we'll be here by the number of verses we've done, um, we're going to pause for a bit. Um, But these ideas have become very, very mainstream. So even um, the Alpha Course, which um, is really very mainstream now and has done so much good in this country, teaches the same basic idea. So, um, Nicky Gumbel, who who wrote the course, he is dead against the Corinthian problem. Um, So here's a bit. uh, There is no such thing as first and second class Christians, uh, nor does it mean that God loves us any less if we don't yet speak in tongues. Crystal clear on that. And yet, um, a big slab in the middle of the course is about making sure you get a specific experience. And that specific experience is described in terms of a new level with the Holy Spirit. So let me give you the sort of illustration, which is about uh, an old gas boiler in your house. If it is just becoming winter in your house and you um, have one that doesn't work like this, you have a problem. Um, So some people have only got the pilot light of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Whereas when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they begin to fire on all cylinders. Do you see the image? You you, you have the Spirit. The Spirit lives in you um, as a tiny little pilot light with no heat and no power. Um, If you had the experience properly, you would be like, quumph, when the boiler goes, uh, is the point. But Paul thinks that every Christian has the spiritual gifts. Every Christian has drunk of the Spirit because every Christian has the Spirit because they believe in Jesus. Um, So this issue is very important. I've put on the box, uh, on the handout, some verses. We're going to go through most of them, I'm afraid. Um, We're going to take some time, and I hope you would study them yourself as well. Um, Because Paul's point one, every Christian has the Spirit, um, is that the basic beginning to understand everything else we'll need to say over these few weeks. Um, Please notice, I'm not saying... Um, that if somebody kind of doesn't agree with what we're about to say about the baptism of the Spirit, then they are as bad as the Corinthians, uh, or they're not real Christians or something. Just saying this is important. And actually, it is pretty widespread to get this wrong, I think. So first of all, I've put a load of references, the top line there, are to other places in the New Testament that make it clear if you're a Christian, you have the Spirit. So Romans 8 verse 9 is perhaps the clearest. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Um, Then running through them, to be a Christian, what do you get if you are a Christian with the Spirit? It's to be given the Spirit, Romans 5. He's the one who pours love into our hearts. Um, It is uh, to receive the Spirit. It is to receive the Spirit of adoption as sons. It's how you get to be God's child, Romans 8. Uh, And it is to be sealed by the Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance and redemption, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4. So no Spirit would mean no love, no adoption, and no guarantee. And uh, where these verses talk about how you receive the Spirit, how you get the Spirit, um, they say by believing in Jesus. So uh, exactly what verse 3 of our chapter says. So Galatians 3 Um, says, answer me a question. Basically, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Um, In a book where works of the law is the baddie. And that's the wrong answer. How did you receive the Spirit? By hearing with faith, by believing. 
or Ephesians 1, verse 13, when you heard and believed, you were sealed. So what do we say then about the baptism of the Spirit? Where does that come up? Well, it comes up in, in Acts. It's talked about in Acts, and it's talked about in the Gospels. Um, and in Acts, undeniably, some people have a very dramatic experience, a huge experience. Rooms shake, um, fire lands on their heads, um, an experience that I have not had. And it, it is a very easy job to, to take a bit of those experiences, some of those people's experience, read them out to a congregation, and say, is your spiritual life like that? No. And well, in that case, you need something more. Um, but that is to make a jump the Bible doesn't make. Uh, when you read carefully, baptism is not used for a second experience later in a Christian's life that not everybody has. Um, the word baptism, the word baptism is a, a fairly normal word. It could be used like that. Uh, it only means washing, like washing your hands. It could be used like that. But baptism in the Spirit uh, only ever comes up in, in the Bible connected to John the Baptist's baptism. It's the only times it, it meets. It isn't connected to something like the Spirit washing me. Um, it is connected only to John the Baptist's baptism. And John the Baptist's baptism had a very fixed meaning. Uh, it is always about repentance and forgiveness. And every single time the baptism in the Spirit is talked about, it's talked about as being better than John the Baptist's baptism. Better than, but not different from. So Jesus is going to baptize with the Spirit, not with water. And praise God, because water will just take a bit of mud off. Um, Ben's looking particularly keen over there, uh, clean over there. Um, but the Spirit baptism is what will make a difference inside, bringing forgiveness and a clean heart. But the thing he's doing is baptizing. We know what that means. It is connected to repentance and forgiveness. Same thing, um, Acts 2, when the Spirit comes at Pentecost, Peter offers that promised Spirit to a whole crowd. And he says, repent and be baptized, Acts 2 verse 8. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Same connection. And uh, when we have them talking about somebody who has received the baptism of the Spirit, um, they talk about it as proof. But they don't talk about it as proof that the person has been a Christian for a while and has kind of bumbled along for a bit, and now they have second, the second experience, and somebody's repaired the gas boiler, and they're kind of warmth Christians. They talk about it in terms of proving they're forgiven. So Acts chapter 10, um, Peter is preaching about forgiveness, and then the Spirit falls on a guy called Cornelius. It's the Spirit poured out, it says. It is the Spirit received. And they say that proves that we cannot withhold water baptism, which is the sign of repentance and forgiveness. Then uh, in Acts 11, they talk about the same incident, um, they say, we went to give a message of how to be saved, and then the Spirit fell. And at that point, Peter remembered about John the Baptist's baptism, and about the promise that Spirit baptism would be better than it. And we remembered that he gave the Spirit baptism to us apostles when we believed in the Lord Jesus, and that means it proves to him, uh, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And he wins the argument and everyone else there says, God has granted the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. Not the second stage, but repentance that leads to life. Um, you might want to add Acts 5, 31 and 32, um, which does the same thing, ties repentance, forgiveness, and the gift of the Holy Spirit to people who obey God. Now, please notice, so far I've not said very much about timing, just that baptism of the Spirit, even with all the kind of signs like the gifts in um, our chapter, it, it, goes with, it means repentance and forgiveness. That's what it always means. Now, in Acts, though, there are um, two occasions. Next line down, if you're still alive and still following it. Um, next line, there, there are two occasions where people are forgiven, but they experience a delay uh, of the kind that Pentecostal friends of mine talk about. They do receive that kind of delay. Um, so the apostles, they have to wait uh, until the Spirit is given at Pentecost before they have that experience. 
And then in Acts 8, a group of Samaritans, they believe, but they don't have the Spirit until the apostles come and pray for them to receive him. Now that is, um, those two incidents are very important bits of data about the Spirit. It's part of the Spirit's own teaching about himself. Um, Please, nobody is saying that because they come in a narrative book, um, we should disregard them and uh, read verses like 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 3 instead of them. But when something happens in a narrative, it is right to ask um, whether the author means us to think that is typical for everybody. Am I just like them? Or are they unique? Is that something that happens to them but doesn't happen to everybody else? And uh, with the apostles, I think that is just obvious. Um, Pentecost is the day promised for many, many hundreds of years when the Spirit would be poured out in a new way. So if you are a believer before that day, um, your experience is going to be unusual. Of course, there'd be a delay in their case. The, um, The Samaritans, though, they look a lot more like us, don't they? Until we remember who they were. Um, See, actually, they are a lot more like the Gentiles than we think they were. All the um, the references, the proofing, proving references I gave you earlier, were all about um, God's promises coming to Gentiles. And when a Gentile gets God's blessing, um, that is such a hard idea for Jewish people to get their heads around, Jewish Christians, that we need all sorts of proof um, from the Holy Spirit. But actually, the Samaritans were nearly as difficult a case as that. I don't know if you remember bits and pieces in the Gospels where you pick up the relationship between Jewish people and Samaritans. The good Samaritan, for instance, is a surprise to Jewish people. Um, Because the Samaritans uh, were the people who were left behind in the land when the Jewish people went into exile. And they intermarried with other races and spiritually... Um, to a Jewish person, they'd have seemed to be far beyond, far below um, the people of God. And if God is going to do his great work of bringing Jewish people and Samaritans together into the people of God, uh, accepted together, then God needs to do the same work of really proving these people have the Spirit. It's really okay. You can believe it. And actually, Acts 1 verse 8 that's on the sheet um, that lays out or sort of divides the world up into exactly those divisions. It says the gospel is going to go from Judea, then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the world. So Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. And every time the gospel crosses one of those dividing lines, Peter the apostle has to be there to see that the Spirit has dramatically demonstrated those people are really in and validated. So Acts 2 for Jewish people, Acts 10 for Gentiles. But in Acts 8, the gospel gets to Samaria ahead of the apostles because of a persecution. So in that case only, God holds back Pentecost until the apostles get there, until Peter can be there. So um, their experience will only be yours and mine if we belong to some new category of human beings, as if it goes Jewish people, Samaritans, Gentiles, and the Welsh, or something like that. Um, Only if you can find your own category. Now, um, also on the sheet, um, I've put two other events in Acts that I've heard used as evidence for a a second experience. Um, One of them is Acts 19, where the text makes it really clear the people there are not Christians at all. Um, And actually, as soon as they become Christians, they receive the Spirit. It's actually an example of it all happens at the same time. Then the other one is Paul's own conversion. And in Paul's case, there is a delay of three days between hearing Jesus on the road and receiving the Spirit. Um, But that experience three days later when he receives the Spirit, that is also the point at which he is baptized with water. And it's also the point at which he has the, um, the blindness judgment lifted off him. I'd say what we've got with Paul is more like a conversion that takes three days than it is like um, be a Christian for a bit, bumble around for a bit, then maybe get a second experience when the boiler turns on. also think probably Paul is fairly unique and we want to be careful. So in Acts, here's something you could do that isn't on the sheet. You could look up. Everywhere that the um, Bible talks about baptism and the spirits, baptism of the spirits, uh, you could look up all the references in Acts. 
You could also look up all the references to the big dramatic things that the Spirit does, like the Spirit falling on you and the Spirit being poured out on you and to receiving the Spirit. And all of those references talk about the same event. All of those references, and they are all about conversion, which fits with everything we've seen from the um, epistles, which must mean that if you, have a Christ, if you are a Christian, you have the Spirit, and not just kind of hidden away inside you like a pilot light, but as if you really had him, that you don't need a second experience to really tap into the gifts or the blessings promised in Acts. Which means also we need to say that, um, which Acts supports, there isn't one experience which would show you've really become a Christian or show you've really been baptized in the Spirit. Um, And actually, you may or may not have the things that people had in Acts. And that doesn't mean you're a second-class Christian. But um, last thing in the box, and really sorry if you're trying to fit your notes all in that little box. Um, But last thing, the fact that there is no kind of definitive second stage doesn't mean there are not kind of fifth and sixth stages. Um, What I mean is, we've been clear you don't kind of trundle along as a Christian for a bit, and then later, if you're lucky, you hit the second stage and go along like that from then on, baptized in the Spirit. There are no kind of stages in that sense. Uh, And nowhere in the New Testament are you encouraged to seek an experience like that, uh, to look for the Holy Spirit like that. But there may be all sorts of experiences and not two, but many. Just um, please let's not call them baptism and let's not call them receiving the Spirit. So uh, as well as Acts 4.31 on the sheet, write down Acts 4 verse 8 and Acts 13 verse 9. Because in each of those cases, there is a fresh experience of the Spirit that is huge and dramatic. And each time it is called a filling. And in each case, it happens to someone who we are absolutely certain has been baptized in the Spirit already. So in chapter 4, it is Peter both times, um, and some other people in verse 31. And in Acts 13, it is Paul. And actually, that fits the rest of the New Testament as well. We are to go on being filled. We are to pray for the Spirit's power and help and boldness and experience. But that doesn't mean we've hit a new level That doesn't mean to say that, that we are anti-spirit or anti-gifts. This chapter, chapter 12, is all about the gifts, and his point is you all have them because you're all baptized by the Spirit. Now, I'm I'm sorry we've spent such a long time there. Uh, Sorry about that, but it is hugely, hugely important. Um, There'll be a chance to ask questions in a few weeks' time, or come and find me if you want to. Who has the Spirit? All Christians, all Christians have the Spirit. You have the Spirit if you're a believer in Jesus, which then makes the gifts much, much easier to understand. So um, quite a bit quicker, we're going to go through the rest of the chapter. Um, Point two about the gifts, verses 4 to 11. See, their um, attitude to the gifts was um, like the playground on the first day back after Christmas. So you come back after Christmas, and um, Andrew got a Darth Vader action figure. And uh, James got a a Stormtrooper speeder, but Tarquin got a four-foot Death Star and an entire Imperial fleet to go inside it. Um, And that means that he is the coolest and the best kid at school. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm just bitter because um, my mum got her ideas about how not to spoil children from being brought up in World War II during rationing. Um, but, um, but, But that is dud logic, isn't it? The playground logic is dud logic if those things, those Star Wars things, are gifts. Uh, You know it's bad logic just from knowing that they're gifts because um, maybe we can say Tarquin's parents are cooler and better than Andrew's parents. Certainly they seem to have more cash to throw around. But we can't say anything about Tarquin at all except that he's strong enough to carry a four-foot Death Star with him into school. Um, He's been given it. It's nothing to do with him at all. Verses 4 to 11, all these things are gifts. Um, They're very varied. Verse 4, varieties of gifts. Verse 5, varieties of service. Verse 6, varieties of activities. But just remind me, how many gods are there? One God. 
Spirit, Lord and God, meaning Spirit, Son and Father, but one God, and these are all gifts from him. The the same Spirit, verse 4, the same Lord, verse 5, the same God, verse 6, verse 11, all these, the whole list, are empowered by one and the same Spirit. And that that is the big point of the list in verses 8 to 10. Um, Each time through the Spirit, according to the same Spirit, by the same Spirit, by the one Spirit, each gift is just that. It's a a gift. And if you say that only people with one gift really belong, then you deny that God gave the gifts to all the other people. Um, I'm not planning to go through what all these different gifts are. I guess that's a relief given how long we've been here already. Um, We will work on one or two of them as the, the, the four weeks go on. So the point isn't what each one that's listed is, and actually most of what I've read quite a bit on them and uh, listened to quite a few talks from other people on them, um, lots and lots and lots of pure speculation about what these things were. Um, the list actually doesn't seem to be that important. Do you know every single gift list in the Bible is different? And actually only one gift, only prophecy, appears in all of those lists. So what's on the list can't be that important as a kind of checklist. Am I real? Do I have that one? Which one am I? Can't be about that. The point is these are gifts, given things, and they are given to all, we said that already, and they are for others. And that is the big shock for Corinth in verse 7. Verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the whole point of God giving these gifts is not so they can be mine, but so that they can be theirs, yours. Uh, It's for the common good. And using them to show off or to, to segregate, that's not just wrong, that is the opposite of what they were given for. Give you a stupid example. I only, um, I only found out recently that there is a whole world of competitive first aid kit shopping. Did you know that? Maybe you are the appointed person at your workplace um, and you knew that already. But um, I did a course recently and this guy, um, he pulled out all the different sorts of defibrillator that there were. Um, and there's a lot of them. And uh, he, the defibrillator, the thing that kind of brings you back to life, th- those things. And um, he has several personally. Um, so he has um, the one that lives in his car all the time. And that, was, that only cost a grand, um, which he says is a bargain, so you should all have one of those in your car, um, which is fine unless you think that a car that costs a grand is a pretty expensive car. Um, and then um, he has this kind of super special one that he keeps at home because he is a, a specially appointed AHS first responder, um, and that is very impressive. Then there are kind of big ones for offices to have um, that could do, I don't know, lots of people at once to <laughs> some kind of big, big, um, bad piece of news. Um, And there's kind of smaller ones you put in your rucksack and carry around with you. Um, But that's all kind of fun, isn't it? To me, it all began to merge into one. But just imagine if that kind of competition got so carried away that people forgot what a defibrillator was for. And they they are for other people. That's the point. And they are for the common good. So imagine I'm at some first aid conference and uh, I'm stuck away in the corner, shunned because my first aid kit comes from boots and costs 30 quid. Um, And then I drop down with a heart attack. Now, at that point, you don't want everyone arguing about who has the nicest defibrillator and, you know, who is more important and which one costs more. Um, You want to say... Um, I don't care which one is nicer, strap it on me, bring me back to life. That's the point. It's for other people. Poor, foolish, ignorant Corinthians. Um, These are gifts. Every Christian has them. Nobody is more special than anybody else. And they only exist for the benefit of other people. And uh, next week, we'll come back to more ways of of getting that wrong. But um, maybe just after the service, you might want to begin that work with your neighbor. Um, Maybe say, um, what gifts do you think you have? Uh, Ask them that question. And then ask them where they're tempted to forget that those gifts exist for other people, not for themselves. That might be something useful to talk about. Because um, third point, see, instead of looking like the Corinthian church... Um, We're supposed to look like a body. Point three, the body needs all its parts. 
And uh, Paul's talked about a church being a body fairly often, uh, chapter 6, chapter 11 of this letter. But here he really goes to town. It is long, it is repetitive, uh, every point is made twice and then made again and driven home. The point is we are different. We have different gifts, but we are not different because some of us are better or more spiritual or more useful. We're different in the way that our bodies are made up of different parts so that the the whole thing works better uh, for the common good. And his his point stands, I think, despite blood donation and and organ donor cards and that sort of thing, you, you cannot just go around chopping bits out of people and expect everything to be okay, even though that is what they've been doing in that church. So it comes in two bits, 14 to 20, can anyone say I don't belong? And this bit is, is aimed at the people who had bought the lie, uh, the people who felt less impressive, the people who worried, because I don't have the impressive gifts they care about, I'm probably not a proper Christian, I probably don't belong here, because my gift or my experience is not as impressive as theirs, I don't belong. And the, um, the body image is beautifully simple, isn't it? Um, just because your feet spend all their time uh, inside shoes and being stood on doesn't make them less part of the body than hands. In fact, he says, verse 17, let's, um, let's try and think what a body would be like if we ran it the way that you Corinthians run a church. So verse 17, if we ran it that way and just took the part of the body you like best and made that the whole body, what you get is not a really brilliant body. What you get is a nightmare. This is what happens when you eat too much cheese and sleep, isn't it? This is the kind of huge floating eye or huge ear slithering down the corridor towards you. That's what you get. Um, You don't want a body that is all eye. And that's a bad body. It's a nightmare. So the person who maybe has one of the gifts in verse 28, uh, the person whose gift is helping or administrating, And uh, the rest of the people at Corinth look down on them because they only care if you do a gift that we can show our friends and say, look, that's a miracle. Um, Whereas this person is specially gifted at helping. And again, we're speculating. We don't really know what they were helping with, um, helping with people who are suffering maybe, or um, maybe it was just something as simple as uh, being able to be the person who week after week um, put their hand down the loo and unblocked it because the kids had put the toys down the loo again. Um, Now, what would it be? They they all look down on them because they speak in tongues and you're just the the loo boy. But verse 18, God put this body together. God put you in his body as he chose. And actually, verse 17, if the whole body was a tongue because they were all speaking in tongues and you weren't there doing your your loo thing, um, then all the tongue would be doing would be flapping around in what's been coming pouring out of the drains, um, which wouldn't be very good. So that's the person who feels they don't belong. Second bit, verses 21 to 26, um, we turn and address the super confident ones. Can anyone say, I don't need you? And he says basically, all right, you think you're the eyes and the hands of this body. You think you're the important ones because you are visible and public and strong. But all he says is, um, but that, that doesn't seem to be how you run your own body. Isn't that strange? And uh, apologies to anyone who didn't enjoy the scatological illustration just now, because Paul is about to go lower than that. Because verse 23, he asks them to think about their genitals. Uh, Those are the less honorable parts that we treat with greater modesty. And the the point is, even if you think that somebody else and their gift is the the sort of sweaty crotch of the church, um, just remember how much you would jump if somebody kicked you there, basically. Um, You you, you say it's all about the eyes and the hands, um, but think how careful you are that those bits stay protected. There's whole sections of sports shops I don't really understand because I didn't play the right sports when I was a kid, but they're all about that. Um, And I I don't see you leaving your flies undone just because those bits aren't the eyes or the hands. And God feels the same way about his body. Um, Verse 24 You may write people off as unimportant, but those may be the people who God gives greatest honor to. And the aim is still the same. Verse 25, the aim is no divisions and care for one another. 
Uh, if you don't believe me that's how your body works, then grab your ear- earlobe now and try and drive your nails through it and see if your foot is having fun. Um, we're supposed to be a united body, um, each with gifts to use together for each other. Um, but that is not the way it worked in Corinth and not the way it's worked very often since then. Um, we're going to go next week and look at more ways again, as I said, but um, I've been in meetings where the gift of tongues has had exactly this role, um, to set apart the people who really are it, really have the Spirit. I heard about a student saying um, recently to a, a senior Christian, um, you don't have the Spirit like me because uh, you don't do this or that. Um, but just before we finish, it, it's really easy, isn't it, to point the finger outside this room to churches and movements we think get this wrong um, and not say, actually, which are the gifts that we say are the eye gifts and the hand gifts. And it, I guess you'd say, people say it about us, um, that we think that way about the Bible teaching gifts, that the RML leader um, or the preacher are the ones who belong and other people don't. Um, same thing, what this chapter's been saying all the way through, every Christian has the Spirit. Spiritual gifts are given. They're not awarded like merit badges. They're given to every Christian for the sake of other Christians And the point is to make the body more and more united. Let me pray. Dear Father God, praise you so much for the Holy Spirit. Praise you that uh, in this age of the Spirit, you pour your Spirit on all believers. uh, That young and old uh, have your Spirit flooded into their hearts. Praise you, Father, for his gifts of adoption and love and assurance. Praise you also, Father, for the spiritual gifts that he brings, that we could serve and love each other. Father, please help us as a church. Help us to rightly value each other. Help us to rightly value the Lord who gives these gifts. And so help us to keep gifts in the right place, that we would know they're for all and for each other. We pray you'd help us, Father, as we come to apply these chapters to ourselves over these weeks. In Jesus' name, amen.